let's see example 11.1 .1. Says you've got a 10 foot long rectangular ASTM A572 grade 50 uh, steel plate that is 1 inch by 12 inches in cross section and is used as a hanger and subjected to a tensile load of 240,000 pounds. That's a lot. The proportional limit of the steel is assumed to be 45,000 psi. Calculate the axial stress, the axial strain, the transverse strain, the total axial dimensional deformation or change, and the total transverse or 12 inch side dimensional change. Refer to Appendix G for necessary mechanical properties. And that's so, you know, you might expect that you're going to have to go to Appendix G quite a bit in this chapter to do any problems. Okay, so the solution for that. So we've got, what do we know about this thing? We know that it's a 10 foot long. So L, just in case we need it, is 10 foot or 120 inches, right? Potentially. Uh, what else do we know? It's ASTM uh, A572. And this is just the spec for the for the type of material it is. Grade 50. Steel plate. And we know that that is uh, one inch. So the the area, if you will, is one inch by 12 inches or 12 square inches, right? In case we need that. Subjected to a tensile load, so that in the last thing we called that P, right? 240,000 pounds. The proportional limit is 45,000 PSI and I uh, don't remember what the proportional limit uh, signification is. Let's see. And they're really not showing that, are they? Interesting. Okay, so to, to solve this problem, the actual tensile stress, so back to chapter 9, wasn't it? Tensile stress was P over A, right? And that's uh, 240,000 pounds. Divided by 12 square inches, right? Twenty thousand. PSI. We use PSI or KSI is okay, right? Pounds per square inch or kips per square inch. And there really isn't anything else on that. A couple people had some different answers on their uh, quizzes, and uh, that's really not going to be acceptable from here on out. Because you know there there are certain units that they use in engineering tech type stuff that you, you have to get used to using. Okay. Okay, so what's that? It says the uh, actual tensile stress then is 20,000 psi, and note that 20,000 psi is less than the 45,000 psi, which was the uh, the uh, proportional limit, right? So we're not going to exceed the proportional limit by any stretch of the imagination. So that, and we'll just note that that's less than the 45,000 psi for the uh, proportional limit. If 
we get past that proportional limit, things start changing and won't come back, will they? Is what's going on there, okay? So you get that deformation. Okay, so then what? Uh, that's that's part A. Is that proportional limit similar or the same as like the yield? What is it? Yield strength? Yield, yield point. Point. Yeah. Yeah. So on that curve, if you will, you know, you get the curve and it goes up and it does like that. You're looking because then st things start changing. That's when you start getting that neck. And once you get that, you, you can't go back. So, kind of screwed then, potentially, unless you want it to change. You know, in the case of the shear bolt, you know, if you want something to go, to break, to protect something else. Okay, then for the axial strain, so we've got to find, uh, what are we looking for here? The axial strain is this uh, epsilon, right? And what they're using there then is the uh, modulus elasticity equals the stress, oh, let's see, the stress over the strain. Hopefully you can tell the difference between those two, what look like E's, that's epsilon. Okay, so what do we have then? Uh, so then they, they rearrange that, right? And we swap these two out essentially. So to find that stress, or excuse me, the strain, we're, um, we're gonna take the stress, divide it by the modulus of elasticity. To do that, then we already have some of that, don't we? We figured out the uh, stress, 20,000 PSI divided by the modulus of elasticity. Did they give us that? Or they just said steel, right? So it's 30, what was it, 30 times 10 to the sixth PSI? Punch those numbers in there and you end up with point zero 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 six seven inches per inch, right? You know what that would be? Strain. I get enough yeah, I got enough zeros. So we had to calculate the stress to find out what the strain was. Then what? So they ask us for, yeah, A was the axial stress, B was the axial strain, C is the transverse strain. So to find the transverse strain, if I can find my mouse again, C, the transverse strain then, so we're looking at strain again, is equal to mu, Poisson's ratio, times the axial strain. And that's that ratio, isn't it? That uh, Poisson's ratio relates that stress and strain type arrangement. The proportional limit, or not the proportional limit, but the proportionality of those. That uh, mu value comes from uh, uh, appendix G, right? We weren't given that, I don't think. So if we go back there and look, what? Oh, I was. I thought maybe you were giving me the page number. No, five hundred one. Yep. Okay, so five hundred one. That's the last column there in the chart. Steel ASTM. Uh, what was it? 
I'm not seeing it. Yeah. It's not there. That's interesting. That's, it's, it's, uh, that seems to be a common theme in this book at this point, doesn't it? I don't know if it's just this release or what, but a lot of those things don't add up as far as the right, the right uh, calls on that. So they're, are they using uh, A36, 501, A501? Yeah. So, yeah, the let's see, and they're using what's the? Uh, are they given? Do they give us the tensile strength or anything? That's what I was looking to see if, because that's the the ultimate strength and the tensile strength, tensile yield strength are, but we're not using those, so it won't much matter. So yeah, the point two five. Uh, I'll try to be a little more. Uh, aware of that when we look at the 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 uh, problems for you to solve I'll make sure that that matches up so we don't have that problem okay because that's not uh, that's not a very good practice <laughs> to not have the, the examples in the in the book anyhow so we'll use the uh, the point two five for Poisson's ratio there what did I do there? Did I just get rid of some of that? Oh. That's neat. How do I do that? Flip of the hand, right? Magical. This class is magical. Okay, so we just use, basically we're just plugging the numbers in there then, aren't we? Again, This should help your grade. 0.25, which comes out of uh, uh, Appendix G. And then the uh, strain, the axial strain, we calculated to be 0 0.000, whoops. A little carried away there, didn't I? Three zeros, six seven. Six six seven. I thought, well, we'll just make it six seven. I thought I'll already put it in there. That calculates out to zero 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 one six seven. Okay, that's the transverse strain. Again, that's one of those uh, strain calculations. It's kind of a dimensionless dimension, if you will. So then, for the total axial elongation. Which that kind of almost gets ahead of well, I guess we did do this, didn't we? We did that for D back in chapter nine. We used uh, I don't know that we used that calculation, did we? The strain equals the deformation. I guess we did deformation over the original length. So we're we're looking for the deformation now, right? And we switch this over to the other side of the equation, so we have the strain times the original length. So we've got the strain was 0 0.000667 times the original length. Oh, well, let's see. Oh, okay. They've got the, they did the uh, 10 feet times the 12 inches per foot. I already did that, didn't I? 120 inches. Everything else is in inches, right? We did all these calculations in inches. We better make this one in inches for all the strain and all that. So be careful on that. Don't get caught taking a shortcut when you really didn't mean to take a shortcut, right? All of these calculations above were done in inches. Don't come down here all of a sudden and say, well, that thing's 10 feet long because then your answer is not going to be quite right, is it? Because everything else was based on inches. So, the amount that thing is going to change, right, is 0 0.08 inches. 
based on that loading based on loading and all the strain calculations and all that uh, let's see the total well that's just on that unit I guess the total transverse change in the 12 inch uh, dimension total axial elongation okay so the other one is E is the transverse so D was this was the change in the axial elongation is going to be the change in the uh, length right and right this is change in let's just write that in there change in length if you will and then E we're essentially going to do the same thing the deformation is the strain times the length the original length which in this case it's point zero 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 one six seven okay that was this strain up here times the length 12 inches as opposed to the 10 feet okay and that's going to move then what two thousandths of an inch Right. On the 12 inch dimension. Right. Because it was a 1 by 12, right? right? So it would be, yeah, 11.998 when you subject that kind of a load to it. So it's going to stretch 80 thousandths along that 10 feet, right? Not a lot of change in 10 feet. Unless you had just a 50 thousandths gap. <laughs> then it would be a lot of them. then you've got a little bit of an issue but what do you and that's what we go into later on in this chapter what happens then if it is going to be confined to a certain distance and it hits that distance it's only going to go to that distance but then what you're doing is you're building up some stress internal stress in that material and that's what we have to calculate then later on so you may have something that's totally constrained. You know, there's a rod between these two ro uh, walls in this room, and it it has a different coefficient of expansion. Now you got a problem. Okay, the walls. You know that this whole building would grow or get smaller depending on the heat and, and cooling, right? But if that if that bar that's stretched across this room changes, it's going to want to make this these walls either pull in or push out it's not going to it well hopefully it's not going to if you designed it right it wouldn't do that but it builds up more stress in that bar then because of that Carrie looking at me kind of funny I like you don't believe that no I'm just thinking about how that would apply to other situations I'm just, that's just my thinking uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> That's, I, I thought there'd be smoke coming out by now, coming out of the ears. Uh, uh, situation, do what? A what? Uh, yeah, any kind of heat uh, in a combustion engine, you know, it's going to change. I mean, even the, the, that's why the cylinders and the pistons, the cylinder walls and the pistons aren't exactly the same. And you have a ring in there to keep the, the gases from escaping, if you will, or to keep the gas and the air from escaping so it'll, it'll detonate. So, you know, if you, but if you happen to have pistons that expanded at too, too much of a, a rate, if you will, compared to the expansion of the, the um, uh, cylinder walls, you'd have a problem when you, you'd lock your motor up. So, Exactly. Yeah, you, you might you might actually get like a gap, you know, and, and it's it could even be it, it could even be a problem between the uh, the the water jacket, if you will, of the engine. You know, there's water going through the head to cool it, right, and it also goes through the block, 
And if that gap, if that hole changes, you might have a problem there even. So yeah, there's, and and that's the kind of things that anybody that races, you know, they're they're really subjecting those engines to a lot of stress and a lot of temperature change and all that. So yeah, all those things come into play, don't they? You really have to think about all that stuff. So a bridge would be another example. You know, they've got expansion joints on a bridge because the ground doesn't heat up and contract as, as the same as, as that metal that supports the bridge, but usually there's a pretty good size expansion joint there, right? Well, what happens if for some reason the engineers didn't calculate that right and the bridge decided it needed to grow faster than and more than, than that gap would allow? Then you'd be putting some stress on the, on the uh, structure, wouldn't you? Well, the same thing happens, that's what happens to a road, basically. When the road buckles, you know, you've got, it's still concrete, but it's still expanding at different rates based on the heat. Yeah, I mean, you see that going down the road. Okay, so that's some examples maybe that you could, that's more of a, that's more of a dirt doctor, civil type application there with the, with the concrete, but and there's metal in that concrete too, isn't there? That has to be, yeah, you have to account for that too. So, although I don't know if it has, a lot of times it probably wouldn't have enough stress to, to stress the concrete around it enough to, to make that happen. So. That's blown out or? I well, I think that's where the salt has eaten away the the concrete for the most part. But and, but that's a chemical reaction that you know the thermal expansion and contraction has made a difference too. I know in pyrotechnics they use rebars to take out the aerials. We use you take the air, uh, rebar, put it on the tube, the anchors in the tube, and when the shell explodes inside, the propulsion come out. Three bar holds the, uh, the tube down to the tube Okay. I don't know what that would necessarily, I doubt if that would have much to do with any kind of thermal expansion. That's, I know it gets really hot really quick. But yeah, but I don't know if it would get hot. Does, I mean, would it change the characteristics of the, of the rebar would be my, you know, because it's a real short I know it's, burst. I know they're able to use rebar over and over and over. Really, yeah. it must it must get pretty hot then pretty quick and and change some of those capabilities. Yeah, I would say. So if you had to do a problem like that, now you've had an example of that. So you you're using some of these uh, calculated these equations that you used in chapter nine, and in some cases just rearranging them, right? So you just have to be able to do that. We got a symbol for, for stress and for strain and for deformation. If we're talking about the axial versus the tensile, we put some subscript with there. Right. And they didn't in this example. But actually, they, the only place they did in the example was on the strain. They put it as tensile. But yeah, it. But and there you'd have to be careful there now because oh, and I was going to change. This was the. This was the change in length, and this was the change. In 12 inch direction, how about that? And here we'll say 10 foot direction. Okay. But uh, the only thing I would be careful of there is when we start talking about those different uh, strains, it, how, would you, how would you label that transverse? You wouldn't worry about that. You know, the, you'd almost have to spell that out. Okay, and then axial. Because just a T, we've been using that over and over for tension. So I would be, it, it probably would be best to do what we just did here. 
where they ask you for uh, the transverse strain. You know, we put a C here, and we did the equation. All right, let's go ahead and spell it out. Yeah, and make it yeah, that's. Yeah, you have to be careful as far as using subscripts. You know, I would say be careful of that. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, so let's see. There, they also. Uh, oh, I had some notes here on that. Well. Yeah, if the stresses are below the proportional limit, the transverse stress is proportional to the axial stress. Axial strain is also proportional to the axial stress. So remember, stress is an internal resistance to the loads developed by unit area. And strain is deals with the change in length due to external forces. So difference in stress and strain. Stress is the resistance to the force from the internal area, right? And strain is the change in the length of that, if you will. It's it's a, a deformation type thing. Okay. Uh, let's see what else here. Now, on page 220, they talk about the transverse strain that accompanies the axial stress does not result from a transverse stress and does not cause a transverse stress. Uh, if the transverse strain is prevented in some way, however, transverse stress will develop. That's getting back to where I said if we have that coefficient of expansion different and you're, you're locking it down, then there will be some stress involved. Internal stresses that are built up because it can't go anywhere. It has to be, okay? Uh, let's